Welcome to the next interview for AATRN, the Applied Algebraic Topology Research Network. Within our community, we have a lot of knowledge, not only about research, but also about professional development. And the goal of this series is to hear from, to learn from, and to celebrate our community stories. So our interviewer today, i.e. the person asking the questions, is Professor Tomas Gideon from the Department of Mathematical Sciences at Montana State University. Tomas received his Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics from Cornelius University in Bratislava, Slovakia, and his PhD in Mathematics from Georgia Tech in 1989 under the direction of Professor Michaikov. Tomas' research is in applied dynamical systems with applications in biological models, especially models of cell dynamics and gene regulation. He has supervised many undergraduate students, PhD students, and postdoctoral associates, and in 2012 through 2015 was honored as a distinguished professor in the College of Letters and Sciences. Outside of mathematics, Tomas enjoys traveling, skiing, backpacking, hiking, and mountain biking. So thank you, Tomas, for hosting our interview today. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so again, this is something which I will do for the first time on a public stage. Obviously, we have discussions with Constantine over years. Um, I have just uh, realized that I know Constantine more than, longer than I did not know him. Uh, you know, because I kind of like I met you in 1990, um, which is you know probably many many people here um, may not have been even born at that time. Um, so okay, let me tr introduce our our interview interviewee. So Constantine. Um, is you know uh, again uh, somehow a founder or early adopter, how do you want to call it, of, of computational um, topology, intersection of dynamics um, and uh, and algebraic topology. Uh, briefly, you graduated from Wisconsin in probably '86, I think, uh, or some around there. Um, then uh, went to uh, uh, postdoc at Brown. Uh, positions at Michigan State and Georgia Tech, where I met you, and then went to um, Rutgers. So, so that's the introduction. Um, maybe I should start asking kind of the first questions. So again, starting with with a kind of a background. Um, so I know that you know you grew up, and you should tell us where in uh, in kind of a, a Washington State area. Your dad was an economist. Uh, and you had some interest in economy. So I, I'm kind of in, always interested in kind of people having this kind of bifurcation points, like what else you could have done had the situation was different. So if you can tell us also about undergraduate uh, education and how you kind of started in mathematics. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Bellingham, Washington, beautiful little town. Um, when I grew up there, there were almost no people living there. And you could go hiking in the mountains and not see a person. And I was back there this this summer and took a hike on a weekend with my my daughter and my niece and was just uh, aghast by the fact that it was just filled with people. I mean, there were there were more parking lots up up at the top of Mount Baker now than than there were people when I was growing up there. But, but I guess that's that's how life progresses. Um, I went to Reed College. Uh, it's a small private liberal arts college in Oregon, um, and that's kind of where I I, I defaulted into mathematics. Uh, I wish I could say I had a great life plan, but uh, like like Tomas said, when I went to college, I I knew that I that math was something useful, uh, but I I had taken kind of I guess traditional math courses, right, where uh, you you know the you do all the calculations and then you hit things like the fundamental theorem of calculus and yeah, the prof gives a lecture on it and it assures you that it won't be on the test. And that seemed to me to be the interesting part. So I, I kind of, in my naivete, decided that that math was boring, uh, useful, but boring because whenever you got to the interesting stuff, it wasn't on the exam. So that couldn't be the, the really essential parts. Um, and so I planned to, to either make, to do either physics or economics. Uh, and 
kind of realized that I wasn't going to end up being a physicist because not because I didn't enjoy the subject, but because when I was doing my homework, uh, it really dawned on me. I, we had a second semester of undergraduate quantum mechanics and uh, my friends who went on to do graduate work in physics, they, they really understood the physics problems and they didn't care about the math formalism. And I would just get hung up on the math formalism. And, and so I said, well, that's not the place I belong. Uh, economics, I just kind of felt frustrated because, oh, okay, there were these nice math models, but I just couldn't see how, you know, maybe on the experimental side, how they could be related back to whether you're doing something uh, uh, worthwhile. Uh, so I found myself my senior year, uh, I knew I was going to graduate, uh, and then I had to go out in the world, and I absolutely did not want to get a job. I, the idea <laughs> of me in the morning to go to work was just terrible. Uh, and I had taken a lot of math courses. I really enjoyed it, but it just never really dawned on me that maybe you could do math for, for a living. And, and uh, so, but you know, it sure seemed better than that's Canada. interesting because I have met multiple people who have said that, right? That you know, it's like, oh, I like this, but and then somebody came in and says, like, oh, by the way, you could go to graduate school and you can be paid for being a teaching assistant. Yeah. And you go, like, oh, wow, is that something which happened to you too? Or it, no, it wasn't so much. I mean, I always knew you could go to graduate school in math, right? It, it just somehow me being a mathematician just, just, but it should be getting a job, right? <laughs> so, so I applied to grad school and, uh, you know, I, I um, I ended up at Wisconsin, which I, I think was extremely fortunate for me because uh, I met Conley there, and uh, you know that working with him kind of, in some sense, suddenly made me think, oh, this is this is really cool to think about these kinds of things. And uh, so, did you yeah. apply for other grad schools? So you know, again, this is a bifurcation which could lead to something else. Oh yeah, I got I applied to to uh yeah, you know, Berkeley, but they didn't give me any money. Uh MIT, I think I got a I got a really strange rejection letter from them kind of saying that I did not. It was so impersonal, it was kind of like what I remember, and it probably was wrong, <laughs> something like, you know, your name did not appear on the computer list of our accepted students. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I don't remember what I, I mean, it's not a letter I saved, but uh but uh, yeah, so I ended up Wisconsin, and, and yeah, it was very. In in hindsight, it was a perfect place for me. Very nice. So how do you how do you choose Charlie to be your uh, your advisor? Because there's a lot of other people around there. It's a strong department. Yes, um, I, I think it was kind of his. Uh, well, one thing is that he would show up, and I, I think he was a early morning person. I, I definitely wasn't, so I, I can't uh, say this for sure. But he was, he'd be in his office whenever I got in. Uh, my my uh, graduate office just happened to be on the same floor as his. Uh, and um, then in the afternoons, he'd hang out on the, on the ninth floor. Uh, and if you sat down near him, he'd start talking math to you, hmm. uh, which was, you know, I didn't understand anything he was saying, but it sure sounded cool. So uh, it's kind of this, in a public area, he would just sit kind of in a yeah, lounge? Yeah, or? yeah, and just... Just talk, right? And and um, the other thing was that I took uh, the um, so I was taking a dynamics course that you know a year long graduate dynamics course, um, and the first semester it was very kind of um, maybe geometric analytic, uh, and it just did not did not rock my world. Let's say, uh, and so I was thinking of. of taking some other courses in the, in the spring, a different course. Uh, and I met um, Chris Jones, who was graduating at that point um, in, I, in December. At, and I've forgotten the, the, the name of the, the pub popcorn place that grad students used to go there. And, uh, and I, it was the first time I met him. I, I think he had actually been somewhere that fall and just happened to be back maybe to defend or something like this. And uh, I kind of was just chatting with him and I kind of said, now nah, I'm thinking I'm gonna do something else. And he said, no, 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 Charlie's teaching the course in the spring, you've got to take it. Okay, so not knowing any better, I did. And, uh, and it was a fantastic course. Again, it was kind of, you know, lots of ideas out there. 
Charlie would come and basically start every class with putting some problems up on the board or at least once a week. Uh, and so I would take those down. Uh, again, kind of clueless. I thought these were homework problems. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, I was enjoying the lectures. Uh, and but I thought I should do some of the homework. And most of the problems I just couldn't understand, couldn't get my hands on. And there was one that seemed a little bit more computational. So I spent a lot of time on this problem, got epsilon and then figured, well, you know, it's halfway through the semester and I haven't done anything. So I kind of went into his office to say, you know, I said, I, I you know, I, I'm not getting very far on these homework problems. Um, here's one that I've worked a lot on, but this is, this is, uh, you know, I'm stuck. <laughs> and, and he, and so Charlie said, oh yeah, well, what, what have you done? So I started, you know, kind of showing him an argument and, uh, and, it, and then I kind of said, and then I don't know what to do here. And he said, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's an interesting approach. I kind of got about to this point and then I, I did something uh, a little <laughs> bit different. I tried this, uh, and I'm kind of like, oh, okay. And, and then he said, uh, uh, but this is a really cool problem. And he pulls out a folder with a stack of, uh, of you know, these Russian, uh, everything was reprints, yeah. <laughs> reprints and, and papers, right? And he said, you know, here, you can look at this. And it was... So this are, is really not commonly indexed stuff yet. This was more about like uh, maybe... Uh, it was big, celestial like mechanics. Smale questions like junior No, celestial mechanics. It was a really a, a okay. celestial mechanics, right? And and it was okay, okay. Suddenly, I realized, oh, this is this is what you know. Yeah. Problems like this are problems that that people apparently can't solve, and and that kind of was was cool. It was kind of the first time I've been really introduced to the fact that there are. Um, this is where the frontier is, right? You were like yeah. Right, yeah. putting your nose right, right there. Yeah, and 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 the frontier get you get to the frontier really quickly as soon as you just think a little bit about some problems, and and that was enlightening for me. So, it, I mean, I, what I'm showing you is how clueless I was. I, I still feel the same way. Uh, about I, I, I don't think that's an experience which is so uh, foreign to most people. I guess I don't know if. Um, but also, let me go back a little bit to the to to re read. So, I mean, at some point you mentioned that you really really like the kind of a general liberal arts uh, education, right? Because there are people probably around here who are coming from a much more, um, I mean, including me, right? My education was like, you do math for five years. So my undergraduate was very strong, but I have not learned anything about physics or biology or any other science when I get my, my degree or economics. Yeah, so I, I um, yeah, it was, it was right for me. Uh, at the Again, I really did get turned on to mathematics there. I, I had um, the the first course was a course in um, a derivation of the numbers from the piano Henkin axioms. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was it was a real math course, and, and we learned about the basic ideas of mathematics, which you know that's the cool stuff that always got was always in other places said that's not going to be on the exams right um so at that point i started taking i i had signed up to be a math major when i when i applied because people said you got to pick a, a major that is going to be so you get an advisor that can help you and if you go to a liberal arts college and you say you're undecided then you might get a, a french lit professor to be your advisor um, so I figured, well, if I'm going to do economics or physics, either one will be mathematic, will require mathematics. So let me put down math as the, as the major. Um, and so, you know, that first class, it was, oh, cool. So I, I never got around to switching majors. Uh, and I just kept taking math classes the, the whole time I was there. But again, you know, it, it depends on the person. But for me, there was with few exceptions, there was always some other class that was my priority class, whether it was a history class or a political science class or a religion class. Um, and so I really, I really enjoyed those four years where I got to think about lots of different things. I mean, yeah, I, uh, yeah. Well, obviously, I mean, I, I kind of like the same kind of the, the broad education, but um all right, so you you got a degree from Wisconsin, right? And then you, I think you went to Brown, and I think that was also 
uh, there was a lot of dynamics happening at Brown. So how much that and Michigan, and how, you know, describe the. So I, you know, the, the, um, again, I, so let me, so I think this is, uh, Brown was, was hugely influential in, in, in my career. And uh, so I learned, I, I kind of feel like, you know, when I was at Wisconsin, I learned about uh, mathematics from, from Charlie and, and Paul Rabinowitz. I took a lot of courses from Paul Rabinowitz. Um, and both of them were kind of doing dynamical systems, right? And, and uh, there was a dynamical systems community at Northwestern, Minnesota, Wisconsin. We'd meet at least once a semester. Um, so, you know, I was steeped in dynamical systems. And then I went to Brown. Uh, fortunately, John Malley Pere uh, invited me there as a as a postdoc. Um, and then you know I heard dynamics from from John and, uh, and Malley Pere and, and Jack Hale. And they were kind of you know in some sense working on the same kind of problems that uh, Charlie and Paul were working on, and yet the perspectives were really really different. And that was really, again, a big eye opener for me that they're, you know, same kinds of problems can be looked at from very, very different perspectives. Uh, so and perspective was, like, uh, was, it, was it more inf infinite dimensional versus finite dimensional problems or what is that the main change of perspective or? Um, there was a... Yeah, I mean, well, with with uh, Jack, it was you know just view everything from a, as a perspective from a dynamical system, right? Uh, from uh, uh, Paul, there was much more functional analysis. From Charlie, it was much more you know get everything down into a topological uh, language, right? And and this, um, uh, you know, it, it's very easy when you're in a group especially as I think as a PhD student, right? You, you kind of absorb the perspectives of, of people around you and get lost in that, that cocoon. And then going to Brown and seeing the same kind of questions being addressed from different perspectives, uh, it was an eye opener and, and kind of made, maybe I was just ready at that point to be made aware that it's really, really useful to look at problems from very different perspectives. There isn't a correct way to look at the problem. Um, and so that, that had a big influence. It, it, it stuck with me. But. but I mean, this idea of applying kind of algebraic topology and dynamics or taking kind of a continuous, a continuous processes and rigorously you know, capturing some properties using kind of discrete math, you know, I call algebraic to call discrete mathematics that has roots in Charlie, obviously, right? And calling next theory. Right. right. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't give up that 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 perspective, right? But it it um uh okay so so this idea of trying to understand the global dynamics on the global attractor. Mm -hmm. Right, that was something that that Jack and John were, were really working on. Right, which is not not something that I heard from from Paul or from uh, from Charlie. Um, and you know, I think some of my my earlier work that 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 I really liked. That's the kind of question I was trying to answer, but I was using these techniques that I I'd learned from from Conley. So. Well, at some point, as a you kind of switched to computation, right, or computational view. So that happened, I think, maybe in the late eight, uh, 90s, right? Uh, actually, early early 90s. Okay. Um, when when Marion was was visiting. Um, this is Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech, and it really came about because by that time I had a couple of nice theorems. We and and uh, um, you know trying to find isolating neighborhoods by hand analytically was just so hard. And so there were just all these problems that somehow I thought, oh, those should be easy. But every time I had to do the analysis, I just got stuck. And so I said, well, this is dumb. I should be able to compute these things really easily because I didn't know how hard computation was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's how I how I got started. And, and 
again, complete naivete. The, the stuff that I thought was going to be easy for us to compute turned out to be a real challenge. And some of the things that I really worried about being able to compute, turns out the computer scientists had solved, had very fast algorithms for that. So it, it, it's, again, uh, I got lucky. I mean, I remember that, I mean, uh, Marion Comfrey about a year in 93 or something. Yeah. I've forgotten which. I think yeah, I was still there. Yeah. Yeah. And then Andre Shinchak came a little later, right? right. And uh, yeah. that was kind of the discrete, discrete Conley index theory happened at that point. Yeah. So, I mean, okay, so that's kind of how you went from dynamics, Conley index to the computations. Uh, but then, you know, TDA, I've, the other stuff, which kind of how, how that evolved from. Um, so, okay. So again, my, it, yeah, I think evolution is the, is the appropriate word, right? So, um, yeah, so with, with Marion, we did this, the, we apply, we had a theorem that said, you know, if you can get these algebraic topological invariants then you can prove chaotic dynamics. And, um, you know, if you want people to pay attention to a theorem like that, then you've got to apply it somewhere. And, um, and so we applied it to Lorentz and, and that got people's attention. But if you think kind of abstractly, what we did was we did a lot of numerical, uh, you know, simulations plus error bounds. Uh, and then said, okay, we got good enough bounds so that we can get the algebraic topology right. Uh, in, in some sense, that's just data science. It's just that it's very, very in, data intense data science. Yeah, we're, we're, anytime I need an extra data point, I, uh, I just run another simulation of the, of the system. I mean, that's not quite how we did it, but, but in, conceptually, I, that's how I think of, of what was done there. Um, so, we knew that we could go from a differential equation to the computer to produce, let's call it the data from the simulations. And with a few bounds, then we could do the, the algebraic topology. And then the algebraic topology told us that the what the dynamics were. Um, there was uh, uh, Josh Rice, who was a student of Bill Ditto, they were doing uh, experiments on chaotic dynamics. Uh, and there was a re really nice, inter uh, healthy uh, interactions. This is a physics department still in physics, physics department, right? right. Be between Georgia Tech and, and, the, uh, and the physics department. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, you know, we talked to Bill about uh, uh, what we were trying to do. Uh, Bill's particular interest at that point was looking at, uh, at data from calcium reactions in hearts, and that was just way too, way beyond anything we could hope to do. But, but like I said, a student, Josh Rice, was looking at a magnetoelastic ribbon where you could get lots and lots of data and, and nice measurements in the data. Uh, and so with uh, Josh and Marion and, and Andre Chimchek, um, I think we had a very nice paper where we said, look, if you give me this, this data, you can still use these kinds of techniques to argue that there must be, one well, again, chaotic dynamics in the, in the system. Um, again, very data intensive stuff. Um, and then the question was, well, okay, we can do the low dimensional dynamics. Can we do something for more complicated systems? Bill had uh, since left Georgia Tech, uh, I forget where he went to, uh, but Mike Schatz is doing these, these and continues to do these beautiful experiments on convection uh, uh, dynamics where you get very complicated spatial temporal chaos. So again, we, and you know, this now was with Marcio Gamero and, and Bill Calise, we started saying, well, can we use these topological tools to address that? Um, I think what's what's really interesting is kind of to see how uh, how your background has an impact on how you think about the problems. And uh, um, the you know a lot of TDA gets associated with persistent homology. Uh, and you know, I think of uh, of persistent homology as kind of measuring 
how high the peaks are. And here we were trying to keep track of, of how things move back and forth. So the, the, the actual patterns um, and coming from the differential equations community where you uh, looked at, uh, at evolution of singular perturbations, right? Where you, you kind of set your PDE so the pattern was either a zero or a one. Uh, so we followed that direction and I think we have some nice results, but we really kind of got stuck trying to do the um, uh, get back a, some kind of continuity results. And in, in the sense that we kind of took all the pictures and, and turned them into black and white pixels. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of what you do with these singular perturbation problems. You, 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 you set, you know, you have a parameter so that you get sharp interfaces so that as a PDE person, you you kind of either just track where the interface is and you don't, you don't deal with the slow, fast, slow, fast, yeah, you get a slow right. yeah, yeah, evolution. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it was very exciting to see, um, you know, when, when persistent homology came along, because it was kind of the exact opposite direction, uh, right? Instead of, of trying to see how things were spatially oriented, you saw how things vertically oriented, but that gave, the ability to to have continuity, and we had been stuck uh, trying to do continuity from the perspective that we had. So, uh, I mean, it's yeah. I, mean, I was thinking about it, you know before this, like you know, I know that you know John and and Herbert, right, who kind of started the. I mean, their background is definitely in in hardcore algebraic topology, right? And your background is very different, right? Coming from dynamics, and it, it kind of brings different perspective, different goals, different. And so I, I, yeah, you you already mentioned that, but if there is more uh, kind of ways to 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 contrast that that background, that that will be interesting to learn. Yeah, and, and that was, you know, yeah. So it was really, um, yeah. Again, well, exactly what you said. More eyes on a problem. There's lots of different ways to try to address a problem, and. There's no right way. There's, there's, there are, yeah, the, the more the merrier. And I, <laughs> I think that's something we have to keep in mind. I mean, it's very easy to, to kind of get siloed and say, this is how I'm going to address the problem. And, and individuals need to do that. But as a community, we have to keep encouraging people from other areas, other perspectives to try to work on various problems, even if they don't look very, uh, promising at the beginning so obviously this kind of field you know of computational topology blew up you know over the last 20 years i mean just in scope in depth in everything uh so what are your perspective of how the field has changed and where is it going or you know maybe how it's changed i mean oh, I, I i i it's 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 appeared right i mean i don't again i Maybe that's okay, I think, yeah. even that's even that's the wrong way to say it, right? I mean, if if uh, I'm spending time now trying to learn probability and statistics, you know, I should have learned that as a as an undergrad or as as a grad student. And somehow at that time, it was just something that I just had no interest in. Uh, it just, you know, who wants to deal with with all those numbers? Um, and you know when I could do some nice clean mathematics, um, so so it's you know when I say it just suddenly appeared, you know statisticians have been working on these kinds of problems for a long time, but uh, the the ability to compute and these huge data sets, it just has forced a lot of us to think about things differently. Um, complex problems can now be represented just by sheer amounts of data rather than sophisticated mathematics. Um, so I just kind of feel like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with that. That's... So, I mean, that's something, right? Honestly, I don't know if this is the direction we want to go, right? But um, yeah, you, I, I don't know, for instance, in DMS, right? They it used to be that what was, um, well, this may be different, but um, you know, kind of a physical models and understanding and theorems about physical models was what was the mathematics, right? And it becomes more and more uh, this kind of a data 
representation data extraction extracting information from data which some people say does not give you the same type of understanding right the deep like you know, i don't know what it means right but sometimes i mean you know artificial intelligence gives you a oracle which is able to do things better than humans but you have no idea how things are done so you think this will resolve or this will just we accept that or how does it what does it go okay so i'll just speak for myself because I'm, I'm not going to make any prognosis over this but uh you but, you have this you have the you know, you know there, plan when i try to figure out why i know something or don't know something I, i'm always flummoxed right i mean you know the what does it mean that i understand something right i mean i'm there are things that I've thought I've understood and then somebody else, somebody says something or I read something and I see it in completely new light. And I'm like, well, why didn't I know that? Right. You know, <laughs> so, you know, it, that that's um, um, maybe an example of overtraining. Right. I mean, you know, I've, I've pattern matched to a certain level and this is what I think the problem is. And somebody comes in and gives a new data point and it's clear that, I should have had a more expansive idea of, of what was going on. Uh, I, I don't know. I think, you know, that's a cool question. Uh, I, I, but I don't, I feel far so, from speaking being... of, Okay, speaking of that, right? Speaking of you, you learning now probability and statistics, right? So what would you, if you had, if you could go back and change your training, would you change some of these things? Would you learn more of this? More, you know, what's the... Well, so what I tell my students is take as many classes as you can. When I was at Wisconsin, I was always taking different classes. Um, the only class, and, and so I, I took Lee Algebras with Georgia Bankard, a beautiful class. I mean, one of the most beautifully presented classes that that I took. Uh, that I've but I've never ever had an opportunity to to make use of Lee Algebras. I don't think there's any other class that I took that that. I could say I didn't make use of. And now I'm finding all these classes that I didn't take that I really <laughs> wish I had. So, you know. I, I think that's actually, I, I completely agree with that perspective because I, I, you know, my undergraduate stuff was, and I shouldn't, right, was in a theoretical cybernetics, which obviously is complete nonsense. But we took, a, you know, a bunch of graph theory and discrete mathematics. And only later I, I, you know, made Brunovsky and I was like, oh, I need dynamics is really cool. But those, I thought those class I took in discrete mathematics will never be useful, and they are, right? You kind of find 20 years, sometimes in the future, and you never know where the field is going to go, where your interest will go, uh, what you will use. So more classes, the better. I guess. Okay. Um, so again, I, so, you, okay, what do you think about, I did some topics in, this is the last question about the field, then we'll go to like you you being a professor. But are there some parts of the field, field being very gen, gen, generic term here, which are kind of underexplored, which should have more attention? What what are kind of our um what okay, so, are paying attention? So I I think the I mean, and and this is not the I, I think going one more step and there's already a lot of work being done kind of on the computer assisted proof side um you know homotopy type theory uh at the moment what we have or are what's being developed is you know very sophisticated proof checkers um but i think that's going to have a, again i'm i'm really an outsider on this i, I know very little but i think that's going to have a huge impact on mathematics and and when we get to the point where the the computer is producing interesting mathematics from you know the current AI type uh, methods, you know if protein folding could be solved, then uh, proving things will be solved. And I think it's going to be a game changer for mathematics. Well, we have an AI now, which uh, which translates words to pictures, right? To so art, right. which has been a big deal. So now we can just say, I would like to prove a theorem about this and this, and AI will just go like, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're a ways from that still, but but it will happen, and and I think that will 
you know, have a huge impact on on the field of mathematics. But he would, what, you math, uh, uh, what math? What uh, What what our role is in terms of uh, as mathematicians? So they will all fire us, and we'll just teach you four classes of calculus. Yeah, I'm. I well, why teach them calculus if the computer can do it, right? I mean, I think we'll really have to think about what. I, I think the analogy I keep giving is uh, is chess. When you know when Big Blue beat Kasparov in chess, I figured, oh, that's the end of chess. I mean, who's going to care about it anymore? Um, today, the apparently, and I'm not a chess player, but apparently the AI uh, chess masters now are are much more imaginative than than what the IBM program was doing. And this now the grandmasters train on that, right? They, they'll get they'll lose all the time to these to the to the machine, but they they learn strategies, and I think that's kind of where we will end up. Mm -hmm. Mathematics is a is a formal language. I think it's something that the computers should be able to learn how to do. I, they clearly can't at the moment, but I think they will learn how to do it, and then it'll become a question of oh, what kind of insights? How diff, just like Again, I'm speaking as a as a as an amateur, right? My my understanding is that when when Google's Go uh, played Go, it played in a very very different way than than humans played. Uh, and and I hear again, I'm I read this about chess too, right? So it would not surprise me if if. The AI driven mathematics looks very different from the kinds of mathematics, you know, fundamental structures and uh, than than what we do. And then the question is understanding why that's useful, um, whether that's producing the kind of mathematics that's of interest to us, of use to us. I mean, it could be like, you know, here's an analogy, right? So again, I talked to John here and, and obviously you multiple times. And John's perspective on competition topology is different than yours because your backgrounds. And now you add a third person to the third person in a mix, which is AI with a, some weird, I don't know how you describe their background. Uh, but you know, yeah, that could be a suddenly a different view, different questions, different. You know, that, okay, that's interesting. All right, you're a professor. What do you like about that and what do you don't like about it? You, I mean, what's your what I like, and and you're right, and I have to say this because because you're interviewing is is the graduate students, right? <laughs> well, that's clear from your record. It's not, it's not, you know, there's no, yeah. I mean, that that to me is uh, meeting with students is really the 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 best part of it. Um, and but uh, no, I, I'll go beyond students, I mean, postdocs and, and colleagues, right? I mean, I, I actually think of math as a very, very social activity. Um, I, you know, I like to disappear on my own and, and hang out in my very messy office and scribble and figure out what, what I'm thinking about. But until I've had a chance to talk to someone about it, um, it's, it's just scribbles on a piece of paper. Um, Talking to people about what I'm thinking about is that that's what I like to spend. You know, I can't think of a better way to spend my day than to, you know, to have thought about something and then gone and talked to people about it or listen to what other people are thinking about. That's that's well, I want to add to that. Getting a real job. <laughs> I mean, the, the point is that you, not just graduate students, but you have also a, a lot of lot of collaborators, right? I mean. Uh, I would say everybody who you ever met becomes a collaborator and they seem never leave or very rarely, right? So um, what's kind of the, and you know, I think it's very positive. Um, what's the, what's the kind of a feature of um, feature? Uh, what, how you make that happen, right? I mean, is it something, right? I, I don't feel like I, I make it happen. I, I just enjoy it happening, right? I mean, you know, what can be more fun than sitting down and talking about a cool idea? I mean, there are some, right? I think, and this is my view, right? I mean, you are also open to listening, right? Which is 
um, which is very important, right? It has to be back and forth. And um, I feel that I try to do the same thing with my graduate students, right? They, they, I obviously have more experience, um, but that doesn't mean that my ideas are any way better. They're usually actually more dumb. And so I want to, yeah. Yeah, that's why it's talk about something. It's not, you know, it, it's not the lecturing part that, that gets boring real fast. It's the talking about something. Because, yeah, again, just like, you know, I guess this maybe becomes a theme, right? There, there's lots of different ways to look at a problem. And being open to those different ideas, those different perspectives is is not only important, but it's really cool. It, it's So, I mean, how do you, so, okay, here's the my question. So, if you have a graduate student, right? So, how do you, uh, they usually come to your office first and they're like a little bit, you know, trembling, right? How do you make first, how do you select the, I don't want to say select a problem for them, right? How do you agree? What's the dynamics between, you know, how do you get the thesis part, right? How do you do that? Um, right. So I, I guess my, what I really feel in my heart is that, that the, at least 50% of, of a thesis should be the choice of a problem, right? I mean, up until uh, you get to your PhD, pretty much all along your education, people are telling you what to do. Here's what you need to learn. Here's the exams you need to pass. Uh, even a master's thesis. I mean, what's typically done for master's thesis is you hand the student a problem and you gotta make sure it's something that can be done in a certain amount of time. Uh, and it is kind of within the scope of what the student knows, right? And, and the PhD, I, I think, is kind of the time where you say, okay, make up a problem that you can solve. Uh, and, well, that problem should be interesting or else you're not going to get a job. And so kind of I see my job as kind of making sure that the problem is interesting enough that, uh, that the student can get a job. And the typically what i've what the most common thing is trying to convince a student that uh that interesting is much smaller than what they expect <laughs> right <laughs> you're like i'll go yes yeah i see I, 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 you know oh yeah you can show this that's good enough right i mean it's it's really um the frontiers of science are like you, like you pointed out at the very beginning, you, you bump up to the frontiers really, really fast as soon as you start thinking hard about something. And so uh, it, it, making the student aware that, yeah, that, that step, that's enough, and why it's enough, uh, and that they should have enough confidence that it's enough, that that's a big part of the role, I think. But I think this must be, I mean, this approach, right, kind of like collaboratively finding a problem must have been also something which Charlie would have done, right? I think he was not, because I think there are people who say, okay, you want to work with me? Here it is. Conjecture, go, right? And uh, again, I don't, obviously, I don't think that's that's a good idea, but I would think that Charlie would be the same way, right? Charlie, yeah, he just, he had, just again, talk. we would just, we would talk and he would throw out a problem and, um, then we talk some more about it. And some of the problems I understood and some of the problems I didn't. And finally, there was a problem where I had enough traction that I could get somewhere on. And... But I remember, right? I mean, this when I was kind of my first few years out of um, out of PhD, right? You first come out and you go like, oh, okay, so now I'm on my own, right? And uh, will I be able to first generate you know, interesting problems, second solve problems, right? And then you do feel a few of those and you're like, oh, I guess that's <clears throat> this is working out. And so I feel that probably a lot of young people uh, may have that issue when they get out of college, if they are like, okay, right? So so that part of, of encouraging them to come up with the same, their own problems and and, sh and understanding they can do it by themselves is, is, a, is, a, is a cool thing. Um, all right, so let me ask maybe a few more questions, maybe one more question. So um, again, I'm coming back to this bifurcation because for me, bifurcations happen multiple times along my you know lifespan. Um, so what would happen? So if so, think about going back and see 
if you decided to be a physicist at uh, Reed, or if you got a, I don't know, Paul or somebody else uh, PhD, what, what would you think? Uh, uh, you, you, you broke up. You broke up, or I broke up ex on when you were asking the question. So sorry. You're oh, not sorry. So I'm I'm thinking about um, in your life, you know, trajectory in terms of science, mathematics. Are there some natural bifurcation points which you would go like, well, if I did not change, if I did not go math and read, but I went to physics or uh, or eco economy, I would be now uh, Paul Krugman in Princeton or something. Or is there some places where you would think you will have a different uh, path. I don't know. I, I'm. Uh, I mean, if I think economics, it would. You know, it, maybe this shows you know the the kind of narrow thinking that one's capable of. Uh, I think now is really an exciting time to be in economics, just because of the data. Right, we're mm -hmm. we're able to collect so much more data, uh, and the the ideas again i'm thinking from the mathematical perspective you know the 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 mathematical ideas the statistical ideas uh that are very data intensive but where we can draw conclusions from i i think in economics you know this is a great time for that um so you know maybe if i'd gone into economics i'd be right now doing Doing data science, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah, that, I mean that, that that is quite possible. So economics now moved on from the two curves intersecting, and and I actually don't know. I, I remember when I, I came to tech, and I realized I have no idea how the you know Western economy works because in socialism we learned uh, we didn't learn that right. That was all imperialism. So I actually asked you if you have an economics book, and you gave me some thick undergraduate um, book on economics and I read it very carefully and that's the extent of my understanding of economics which is probably not that great uh, but I, I really enjoy that all right so I think we are come close to the end I don't know if you want to uh, talk about some aspect more or um, we just open to the questions uh, well, let's open to questions I'm okay okay hi thank you sure. again um, okay, so um, for the questions, um, do you have uh, any, so like with previous participants, um, you know, we've heard of some uh, super uh, hidden superpowers, like, I don't know, making furniture um, or, you know, playing a sax saxophone in a band. Um, do you have something like that that you are willing to yeah. share? No, definitely think. not definitely <laughs> not I, well, I, I, it's not that i'm not willing to share if i had a superpower i'd be happy to share it i i, I don't <laughs> yeah like, uh, not no running away with the circus at one point and like working oh no, no i just <laughs> you know yeah. it, it, kind of like i was telling tomas I, I kind of feel like i've gone through life being very fortunate stumbling into into the right right things at the right time without great any great uh great plan to get here very good. And um, what about, um, uh, so mostly, I guess we've been talking about math and your sort of development as a mathematician and then as a professor. Um, and then how about your hobbies and sort of um, what do you like to do outside of math? Um, I like to go skiing, which is why I, I like to head off to Montana whenever I can in the, in the winter. Uh, I've had some very nice ski trips with Tomas, including one where we uh, we went off course and got way up high in the mountains and he actually had to my, carry my skis up to the top of the hill so that I could get down. So again, you know, it, I very much rely on my collaborators, whether it's in, in <laughs> math or skiing. Um, hiking, um, uh, I, I enjoy eating fresh tomatoes. So I, my summers when I'm at home get spent taking care of my tomato garden. Wow. Um, so. I guess that could count it as a secret uh, superpower. <laughs> <laughs> Please take it, it's really good for August and September, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, um, okay, and then um, so a question that we have is, what's your history with coding? Have you coded a lot in your past or are you doing any coding currently? I get by with the help of my friends. Wow. Anybody who's worked with me knows that uh, the, my level of coding is, is not something that should be publicly shared. Uh -huh. um, and... Uh, yeah, no, I, um, yeah, no, all the, all the coding, anything, anything, any paper that I've had that's had coding in it has been a, a joint work and 
the you should just assume that the other authors took care of all the hard work. Very good. And then, um, so um, there is um, a question of how um, you began working with Marian Morzek, and um, was there a specific reason behind uh, his visit to Georgia Tech? Um, yeah, so I would been, you know, so Marion came up with uh, um, a version of the discrete Conley index. And uh, I think I think I met him via Bernard Fiedler. Uh, and then he um, he asked if he could come in and to the to the States. I had just moved to Georgia Tech. Uh, and yeah, so I was very lucky that he wanted to come and and work with me and uh yeah it led to well we're still working together so that was uh, uh yeah so i was lucky that marion wanted to come and work with me let's put it that way and good um and then uh for almost 10 years uh, you were the director um, of cdsns at georgia tech um so what was that and what was uh, your role like as the director so CDSNS really started as um, a, a uh, tool to get uh, Jack Hale and Shuni Chow to come down to Georgia Tech. Uh, and so it was really a center for the, the you know, just to support local research in, um, in dynamical systems. Uh, and so, you know, we had postdocs, we had some money for, uh, for visitors and speakers. Um, and you know that was that was what it was and you know i just yeah so jack ran it from from i guess he moved to georgia tech in 1989 maybe or 1990 um and then um 1990 i guess and then until he retired and then when he retired i i took over as as director and um until i came up to, to rutgers so as a user, I, might, I must say that it was an awesome place to do mathematics because there's always those five seminars a week on dynamics. There was there was postdocs, there was special topics courses. I mean, any type of dynamics you can imagine was available. So, wow, yeah, that sounds great. Um, and then I guess um, for like the more uh, like graduate students in the audience, um, so the pandemic has changed the dynamics somewhat. Um, because for example, I remember that when I was a graduate student. Um, I would attend a lot of conferences, but somehow now due to the pandemic, a lot of activities moved online. I mean, there were some in-person conferences, but like much fewer. And um, it was sort of harder to get an opportunity to present to them because like everybody applied for maybe, I don't know, one um, or two conferences in the area. Um, so like, um, uh, how do you think sort of that will change um, the, the application process, I guess, in terms of making connections? And like, what's your advice to, I guess, your graduate students who are on the job market, like how to somehow compensate for maybe this um, um, less, uh, like lack of contact um, due to the pandemic years? I, I think that's, um, so I don't know if I have any good advice with regard to that. Uh, I think it is a problem. Um, uh, and maybe the, 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 I, I think people should reach out in terms of, you know, writing letters, email, well, letters, I'm, I'm thinking back to when I was a grad student, writing emails, uh, telling people that, that they're on the market, that they're looking, um, because I, and, and the reason I was thinking back is that, you know, when I was in grad school, we didn't go to conferences. I mean, it was, you know, it was much more expensive to travel. Um, and so the conferences I went to were really very local. They were what I mentioned, there was this uh, community between Northwestern and Wisconsin and, and Minnesota. And as grad students, we would drive up for a weekend once a semester to one of these three places. Um, uh, I didn't go to a, to a conference until I became a postdoc. Um, it, it just, it, so, you know, you had to somehow write a letter and let people know that, that, that you were applying, uh, and, send people papers. And, and so I think that that's kind of what students at the moment should be doing. 
I'm hoping that we get back to to much more in person meetings. I, I think that I'm yes. hoping this is a blip. Yeah, so actually, that was actually my next question. If do you think it's going to pick up again? Because there also seems to be a push from different institutions to try to reduce the, um, the sort of uh, carbon uh, footprint, and right. um, a lot of institutions are actively encouraging faculty not to travel, travel, or even um, yeah, I think I've heard rumors that somewhere you collect points for traveling too much, and then you know, like uh, there are penalties in place and <laughs> right. Um... So I guess uh, uh, I guess my okay. So you know, I stayed home for for two years, like pretty much everyone else did. Uh, I've been back to a few conferences now, and uh, and there really is a huge difference, right? I mean, there's a huge, and it's on the. Um, it's on the personal level, right? Just kind of what I what I've talked about before, sitting around and just chatting about a problem. And that is not something that is easy to do over Zoom. Uh, I just uh, so I think it's necessary uh, to um, to maintain in-person context. I think it can be done a lot less than it was in the past. I like I was uh, telling you earlier, I mean, I think what this, you know, what what you guys have put together with these uh, online videos on this topic, the fact that they're up on YouTube and people can watch, the students can watch them, uh, is in the direction of students absorbing knowledge is fantastic. That's just, um, and so the students don't need to go to the conference to hear what's going on. Um, but there's still this personal contact. I don't know how we how we get it other than than meetings. So we could have maybe less travel, but um, but uh, and maybe more focused. But it, it just can't be eliminated. And then, uh, so if this is going to be now the last question. What would uh, do you have any other advice for young researchers that you would want to share before we finish? Make sure you enjoy what you're doing. All right. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's life is short. All right. Uh, if pick whatever problems you find interesting. I mean, if you're going to stay in academia, take advantage of academia, and that is that you have the freedom to 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 work on problems that you're interested in and exploit that. If you just like solving problems and 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 that's cool too. Uh, and you can, you know, get a job in industry doing it. Uh, then, then do that, right? But make sure you. Life is short. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> I think that's um, very good advice. With which I guess uh, Henry is going to take over. Thank you. Well, let's just go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Tomas and Constantine, for the incredibly interesting interview, and and thanks everybody in the audience for joining today and and for your questions. So uh, we'll end here. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.